welcome back to the 21 Convention 2018 of Orlando, Florida. Our next speaker is a dear friend of mine, uh, dare I say, but the best friend I have. This guy saved my ass several times in, in major ways. He has been speaking at this convention since 2011, so for over seven years now. Uh, he's a remarkable speaker who focuses on relationships, and I would say one of the best aspects of his, uh, of his content is how serious he takes those from a masculine male perspective. He also has a new book coming out that just published today. It'll be available very, very soon, including a launch party at his house this Saturday for you guys, attendees only, attendees, speakers, and everyone else. Without further ado, please help me welcome Socrates to the stage. Thanks, sir. Pleasure. Ah, wasn't quite ready for this. I'm Socrates, and I actually help people navigate today's sexual marketplace. I do that because I believe that the sexes are actually meant for each other, that we're naturally complementary and compatible with each other, and that stands in stark contrast to today's society and culture. I also fear that we've gone seriously awry, that through the combination of culture, society, gender politics, and a sheer ignorance to the natural state of human affairs and in their ability to interact, our natural state as human beings, that we've gone seriously awry in all this. My role is to help change that within society. And I'm taking the notion that the sexes are actually meant for each other and doing something about it. About 15 years ago, I had many of the same fears, anxieties, and stressors that many of you face today regarding this environment. I had concerns about where our culture was going. I had concerns about our society, how they viewed men, how they viewed relationships, how they viewed marriage. I had concerns about my own fitness and state as a man, my ability to command, uh, my, whether professionally, personally, my role in the environment. I had concerns about my nature of relationships, my ability to lead, manage, maintain those relationships. I had concerns about the prospects of me becoming a father and what type of father I would be. I had all those concerns, and then I had personal issues that I was carrying, un unfettered baggage that I've been carrying for 20 plus years. And 15 years ago, I decided to do something about it. And very directly, it has led to this moment right now. I went out and sought the company of men like yourselves that were looking to improve upon themselves and their lives, to understand life, the world, their involvement in society, culture, with women, with relationships, fitness, health, finance, philosophy. And I started leveraging the concept that when I was most successful in life, I surrounded myself with people that were striving for excellence, that were striving for a similar purpose. And I found that in a number of ways in my past life, whether it was competitive swimming in high school, whether it was my involvement in architecture and in architectural college in the studios, whether it was my involvement in the US military. I was surrounded by excellence on a repeated continuous basis that improved me. And there was a concept about steel sharpening steel. Okay? And I took that and I applied that to culturally in a kind of in a civilian world and how do you start? Now, it did go down kind of this rabbit hole and I ended up meeting a whole series of characters and fun individuals that I still hold very tight relationships today. One of which was a 17-year-old punk who after a meeting in a public library two blocks from here, decided to put on an event very similar like this. Matter of fact, it is this event. If you can imagine going into an event where you're trying to learn about self-improvements, learn about particular skill trips, and you have a 17-year-old kid saying, we're going to blow this up, we're going to rent a hotel room, we're going to have people fly in, they're going to get hotel stays, we're going to get restaurants, what do we need to do? We're going to put an event on like this. I was in my mid-30s. I knew enough of the individual to say, yep, have at it. Yep, good, good luck to you. You know, didn't stand in his way because I knew better. But he actually went out and did something about it. And in the course of that, I've seen that individual grow and develop and mature to, the, to not only this environment, but him as a man and as an individual. And it has been profoundly something as an older man that I can look to a younger man as an example to lead. So when Anthony sits and says we have a, a relationship, we really do. It's kind of a back and forth fondness for each other and respect out of people putting forth the effort 
and responding to trials and tribulations shared, both successes, failures, missed opportunities, and a lot of laughs. And so ultimately, I did do something about all this. And where it led me is when I come home today, <clears throat> I hear the feet of my little girl running to me, exclaiming, Daddy, 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 Daddy. And I pick her up and I throw her in the air. And after catching her, that's key, <laughs> I get the biggest <clears throat> bear hug that I've ever had in my life. And in that moment, I'm thriving. In that moment, I'm more alive than any time in my life that I faced death, danger, or when I've gone out thrill junking. In that moment, I am complete. As a man, as a father, and as a human being. That's not necessarily going to be for everybody. That is a choice. It was a choice I wanted and a choice I pursued. <clears throat> I'm also rewarded by the loving gaze of my partner as she looks on in admiration, love, and fulfillment of not only as her as a mother, but as of my partner. And while she may not tell me, I can see everything I need to know in her eyes. And by the way, when I see that look in her eyes, I'm responding to her hypergamy. That is a hypergamous trigger I'm fulfilling. You're going to hear more about that through the coming next coming days. You need to respond to hypergamy, her hypergamous interest, her natural, biological, sexual being as an individual, and there's a drive there. It's known. We can measure it. But you have to respond to that. You also have to be able to command your own. So I ended up doing something about that. Uh, we ended up, let me, let me run a little bit longer. The issue is I actually did something about that. And decisions drive destiny. You need to know where you're going. If you're going to be fulfilled and make best use of your time and energy, knowing your destination is paramount to getting to where you actually want to go. Otherwise, you're going to be aimless. The problem is we don't live in that world. You know, of daddy coming home, picking up your little girl, hugging her, and having a loving partner. That's not the baseline of today's society, and there's a problem there. Currently, it's projected that less than 25% of millennials will ever marry. That's staggering. That is staggering. This is what that looks like. That is a graphic of societal failure. That is a graphic of cultural failure. That is also a graphic of individual failure. This isn't winning. This isn't sustainable. That doesn't work. You don't have to change society. You don't have to change culture. You just have to change your life so that you don't become a statistic like this. And there's plenty of good reasons why this is occurring. From a male perspective, very little respect is afforded to men who are commitment-related. Very little respect. We're mocked, we're disparaged, we're lectured to. Under those parameters, why would you want to? What's the societal incentive that's being fed here? You're being deterred. And it's an external element. We also know that in the same environment, the risks are incredibly high. The penalties are immensely stiff, and the rewards, incredibly low. How do we square that as a society? How do we fuel our evolution of society and propagate it going forward when we're faced with this? The last one, it's never been a better time to be a bachelor. Are you kidding? With social media, feminism releasing sexual ambition out to the marketplace and the culture, where it's free, available, promoted, where being a slut is now celebrated by cultural leaders and thought intellectuals, men of means and ability are able to command that market. They're able to do something about it. They're able to take advantage of that. Good on them. 
I don't think it's necessarily healthy. It's a lot of fun, trust me, it really is. But I don't think long term that is a sustainable element as well. Now for women, we got a whole nother story. Sky is no longer the limit for women. The sky is no longer the limit. Right? Women have the abilities to be anything and have anything they want. Women are, that who are self-motivated, assertive, and smart are, ex are exceeding and succeeding in almost every elements and every areas of life, except romance and everything that comes with it. Commitment, relationships, marriage, motherhood. It's not just that a condom is Cinderella's new glass slipper. Women today very much are becoming refugees in love, marriage, and motherhood. And tell me, when have refugees ever been the victor or winning on anything? And the answer is, in today's social and cultural environment, women are floundering and losing as much, if not more, than men. Another element that I find incredibly shocking is that loneliness is being marketed and sold as a virtue. Think of that for a moment. When has loneliness ever been a virtue? We know that loneliness develops profound and deep psychological wounds. It's a form of trauma. The American Medical Association regards child neglect as a first level of abuse. Neglect as abuse. What do you think loneliness is? Social isolation. It's neglect. Because of this, we know that anxiety, depression, substance abuse, and suicide rates are the highest among those that are most socially isolated. We also know, for example, that the health markers for loneliness are equivalent to smoking. Except smoking comes with a warning. Loneliness doesn't. And we have a trademark for this, don't we? Men go in their own way, MGTOW. How about the trademark, strong and independent woman? How's that being advertised? Positively or negatively? And the results of this is loneliness. The results of this are health indicators associated with carcinogens. For women alone, to give you an idea what happens if you make these decisions, is that women who are going through fertility treatment and infertility have the same stressors, anxieties, depressions associated with women going through terminal illness, cancer, HIV, and suffering the same ill effects as cardiovascular disease. And this is for women who are infertile. Now, nature doesn't care if she's infertile because it's biology or external elements, such as social, cultural, or internal ones you take on yourself because you want to be a strong, independent woman and put your career forward, whatever that may be, in light of your ability to be a mother and command that biologically and have an answer to it. Women are stressing themselves out and killing themselves putting themselves through terminal cases, health risks, because they haven't thought forward on this. And nature simply doesn't care if it's external, biological, or internal. The results are the same. And if nobody's told you yet, nature can be incredibly cruel. So when we talk about decisions driving destiny, having a sense of awareness of these sort of facts, and then rationally taking steps to understand your involvement, what you want, your desires, and planning a course of action rationally to limit this or to prevent this, or in many cases, honestly embrace it. There's nothing wrong with saying and looking at this and saying, that's truly the route I want to go down but do it knowingly. 
Don't do it and find you just happen to be there, because that's where a lot of these issues with infertility come out, is that the decisions have already been made in advance and you're suffering the ramifications of it and having to backtrack for lost time. The lucky ones are able to do something about it. The unlucky ones don't. And because of it, they become a Darwinian failure. Where the risks are higher, you need to be smarter. There is no doubt. Prepare accordingly. I like to go back to this. This is kind of the starting point. This is, this is a graphic that has a lot of sentimental value to me. Uh, but it's Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. And this is when Eve gave Adam the apple. And they were cast out upon paradise, from paradise. This is the original red pill. Think about it. This is the original red pill. This is the tree of knowledge. There's a serpent in there. We'll talk about him later. But you have man and woman in a natural state of being with all the other animals. And it's at this moment in time, man separated himself from all the beasts of the world. We became human. What did the tree of knowledge provide us? The difference between right and wrong, moral and immoral. It allowed us to understand our natural order of things, our natural prerogatives, awareness. All these things come with wisdom. Okay? And that's what the red pill is. It's knowledge that you've got to be able to act on it. Now, the interesting thing here is Adam had a choice. Adam could have stayed ignorant and blissful in the Garden of Eden, just like all the other animals. Except he didn't. He willingly chose and swallowed the red pill. Okay? I also want to look at several other things. Is that When we talk about the serpent in this issue, I believe that's culture and society. Because we don't just live alone between man and woman. There's always society and culture involved. And it's interlaced with our knowledge of the world. Okay? And that serpent right now, is it a benevolent creature? Or is it a hostile one? And the question is, is we need to look at our society and culture and critically examine and provide feedback to it. We shape that. We shape the culture by how we act, how we live, what our expectations, and everything else. Now, going back to the red pill, I think this is a unique moment in time here. This showcases awesome Adam's willingness to defy God to be able to be accepted, and committed to by women. That's a stunning testament that you're willing to give up paradise to be closer to women. That's the nature of man. I also think it's the nature of women. They have the same calm. And they need to respond the same way if they want virtuous men in their lives. Ultimately, I believe the red pill's there not to pull us apart from women. It's to pull us, make us aware of our nature and bring us closer together, not further apart. So what does the red pill teach us? And it's not necessarily specifically the red pill says this, but what are the takeaway elements? You know, and if you are always constantly worried about the concerns, and the red pill primarily focuses upon a woman's hypergamous nature, her sexual impulses in nature, and how that plays out in society, her decision making, her relationships, and the risks thereof. What does that actually tell us? It's to be wary, it's to be fearful, it's to be on guard. And when you constantly are fed a litany of things to be afraid of, it's naturally to be fearful. So, what are some of these things? Well, quite honestly, when mommy isn't happy, she'll torch that shit. All right? And the reality here is, if you don't have appropriate behavioral skills, you'll resolve the issue inappropriately. And that will be setting fire to your family and home. Right? Because you didn't get the call of attentions, you didn't get the beg. For, for notice. You didn't get the effect of an indicator of interest. You missed those lessons. You didn't see that, or you ignored it, or you weren't able to handle it. And by the way, you have an obligation to lead, manage, maintain, and repair. 
That's the burden of performance. She does as well. They're slightly different, but she does. And this is a result of not being heard and not having appropriate decision making, okay? Being able to resolve things appropriately. And by the way, whose who's, who's problem is that? Remember, you chose her. You chose a woman that didn't have appropriate behavioral skills. And this is the result. Here's another one. We live in a society that 50% of the marriages will end up in divorce. That's what that looks like. Half that building's on fire. Or let me rephrase it. Half that burning building is burnt. That's the divorce half. A good portion of that building's on fire. And that bottom portion, I guess that's kind of cool to live in. I don't know about you guys. Ladies, I don't want to live there. I sure as hell I'm not going to live there. And that's your problem, not mine. If you want men to commit, you want men to marry you, you think you're entitled to that, you have to resolve this. You have to make sure that when you speak of marriage, that doesn't come to my mind. That I know everything you say, and more importantly do, is telling me this will not be the result. And right now, this is completely acceptable in today's social, cultural and social environment. Matter of fact, you actually have bomb throwers. You have suicide bombers in here. You have social justice warriors. You have feminists torching the place, prompting it. How would you like to live in an apartment complex or this building with arsonists, filled with arsonists? This is why men are walking away. We also know that it doesn't end here, does it? Because what mommy doesn't burn to the ground, the courts and attorneys will actually destroy and demolish. It's not over just once the fire's put out. Now, that's just the initial tension. The other thing, and I kind of humor here too, there always seems to be a social, not so much a social justice warrior, but an apologist pissing on your ruins just to keep the dust of the disaster down. This is what men face, this is what men deal with, and this is how we see relationships. And if you think we're fearful, there's a reason, there's good cause. The others, we're also left with what remains. Ruins. Not always just ruins, sometimes they're clean ruins, sometimes they're kind of pretty. But the reality is we're left with the remains of what was, what could have been, and what should have been. And by the way, we pass by this daily. We all know somebody who's gone through divorce at this stage. We all know somebody who's lost custody of their children, who's been alienated from their families, from everything they tried to create. And they're living and breathing and moving amongst us. We see this. We fear this. And it resonates with us at our core. There are reasons why men are avoiding commitment and relationship. And there's a natural response to this. Fuck you, I quit. No. Rational decision-making processes lead men to say no. No commitment for you. No dick for you anymore. I'm going to swear off women. And by the way, there's a lot of integrity in doing that. It's incredibly hard. And that's the MGTOW movement. Men going their own way. Men that are actually separating themselves from other women and people to protect themselves. That's an ugly, ugly testament to society. The problem is, it doesn't really work. For some who are really disciplined, know what they want, will actually achieve it. But they're going against their nature. They're going against our biological nature as mammals. The more likely scenario for the, the hardcore red pill swallower is he'll learn these lessons. He won't get committed, but he'll still engage with women, particularly sexually, because there's a tremendous biological impulse to do so. We're rewarded to doing so. Hormonally, societal, everything else. There's a tremendous desire to connect with women. So what, what usually ends up happening? You know, you would think that this would be a natural male contraceptive. The problem is it isn't. All right? The problem is most of you guys are going to have a weak pullout game. And for the red pill Rambo, the most likely occurrence is he's going to end up having an unwanted pregnancy with a woman of dubious value. And I say of dubious value because they're not screening for women of value. They're not looking for women who would be good mothers, good wives, good partners, women who have social skills, both in relationship skills, relationship management skills, relationship maintenance abilities. They don't have a degree of socialization. They don't have a network of family. 
They don't have a support group. They don't come from institutions that promote and foster relationships. No, you're going after fucking hot. Is she hot or not? And that's all you care about. And by the way, women who don't develop themselves virtuously are responding to base biological needs that tend to be non-virtuous. And you're going to pay for that. Ultimately, when that happens, because biology will win, you'll have an unwanted child. And that's a tragedy. And feminism wins. For an organization, an ideological political movement, that is there to destroy the patriarchy, destroy the nuclear family, and provide tremendous disruption to the natural human order of things. They don't care. In effect, by swallowing the red pill and going astray from your base biological needs and natural human, human nature, our social nature, feminism wins. And they don't need to make you a feminist. They don't need to make you a female justice warrior. They just need you to get sloppy. And sloppy you will. And you will despoil your family tree for two generations. Yours and your child's. If you think we have problems now, give it another 10 years. Ultimately, as an architect, we look at things probably a little bit different than most people. Everybody tends to look at architecture as the mass. You know, for example, this would be a cube if there was no voids. But the reality is that in many cases, the voids will actually tell us more or much more information than the actual mass itself. So for this example, that cube is actually very intricate. We know there's spaces involved, and we know there's a degree of order here in addition to it. We can look at the same kind of principles as to not just what does red pill tell us. Like, for example, I gave through a litany of lists of just on the marriage side of, about hypergamy. We could actually do a series of slides that talked about women's natural sex order. Now, those slides would probably be a little bit more graphic and we wouldn't be putting that content up here, but we could do that. But the alternative, though, becomes fairly interesting is we don't actually hear a lot about what the red pill community and organizations overall don't talk about. And that can tell us a tremendous amount of information about those ideas, about that philosophy, and tell us more information than if we just listen to the people speaking about it. And the first one is, it's gonna be fairly interesting, is we talk about hypergamy. We talk about a woman's biological nature. And we completely ignore the fact that there's a term called hypogamy, a male's natural biological sexual interest. We ignore the other half of the same coin. We're the same species, same mammal. We have the same biological drives. And where they're the same, they're going to be very, very close to being absolutely parallel to each other. But where they're divergent, they become rather interesting. We don't talk about the male version, all right? And the first rule of Fight Club is you don't talk about Fight Club. You don't talk about hypogamy. And there's a number of reasons for that. A lot of times guys don't want that information out. Others, it's fairly well known, and it doesn't need to be discussed. And as long as you can ignore it, you can actually enact hypogamy, your sexual biological male interests, as opposed to combating hypergamy, hers. And if you're worried about the battle of the sexes, that's a damn decent strategy. Because remember, one side's going to win, yours or hers, if you have that viewpoint. I don't. I believe we're compatible and complementary and we're meant for each other. Therefore, we need to work together. But going back to Fight Club, when you take Fight Club as kind of a, a genre approach to it, one of the analyses is, with Red Pill is this combative in nature. You're in Fight Club. You're not there to do poetry reading. It's Fight Club. You're now a combatant, further alienating yourself from women, further alienating yourself from relationships, further alienating yourself from your actual natural state of being a mammal, of being a social being. This can go on. Right? One of the things I'll tell you too, and this, this is an element to it as well, and you'll hear a little bit more later on, is you're not Tyler Durden in this case. We want to think we're, Ty we're Tyler Durden. The reality is we're Ed Norton. We want to be Tyler. 
And there's some value in that, in recognizing that during this whole course of that particular story, Tyler Durden was the hero, the inner hero of Ed Norton. I think there's something to be said there, that you don't have to be this outside honest character, that you can find the, your inner hero, the inner you, that's better than yourself, okay? And lean towards that. Now, in this particular case, it led to self-destruction. But if you can harness that, if you can guide that for positive benefits that are natural in order, you're not going to end up like Ed Norton or Tyler Durden. The other is what stands in stark contrast to the red pill wisdom, and not in every case, and I don't want to sit down and be bagging on just red pill, but the anti-relationship stance of a lot of the red pill rhetoric <clears throat> is that in all cases, not all women are like that. And, that, and it's true, it's an acronym. Because not all women are like that. All women have a hypergamous nature, but they don't behave in the manner in which we talk about. It, they don't have an answer or solution in many cases to why relationships do work. Why when we can stand and see relationships that are healthy, vibrant, and successful, we don't focus in on what are they doing to be successful. We focus on the car wreck. And the problem is when you focus on car wrecks, or whatever you focus on, it leaves a residual image in your mind, and you carry that forward. So if you're constantly looking at the negative, if you're looking at the derogatory, if you're looking at the things that bring you down or pulling you away from the area and the way you want to be, you're going to end up there. It's a natural element. My concern is, how do we present this? How do we do that? The first is, you've got to need to reduce your risk. And where the risks are, are high, you need to be smarter with it. Now, what are the things you can do? First off, it helps if both of your parents are together. We're mammals. And as mammals, we don't learn through rational ways. Okay, that's kind of a new one. Okay, that's the human element. But as mammals, we learn through imprinting. And if you did not imprint as an infant, as a toddler, that there is a loving, stable, connected relationship and fostering in your home, you will have no natural or limbic response in expecting one in your future. If you don't have an example to go by, good luck on reconstructing it yourself. Second one is actually if you have affiliation, institution affiliation, the most common is going to be religious. Institutions that promote relationships, institutions that put committed relationships, marriage, families, people that have that support, fare better, far better than people who don't. And if you don't have that, you're going to need to reconstitute that yourself. And if anybody hasn't told you yet, this right now, what's taking place right now, you are reconstituting an institution that did not exist in your own individual worlds. How many people last night did I talk to that were excited about coming together and meeting people of like mind, of like interests, and that energy that they found by coming together in one place, that they weren't alone? You're reconstituting what you didn't have. And that can save your marriage. The other is if you graduated college. Now, it's a stat. I think it's a little bit iffy, but I think there is some room for discussion here. And the most primary one is the people who actually are educated, they've gone through an institutional learning program, they've actually learned behavioral and relationship skills management, and they commit themselves to longer, long-term tasks and completion of those tasks through hardship. People who have respond to short-term impulses don't tend to actually finish college or programs or what they set it out to do. And people that don't have that ability tend to end relationships. And because they don't have the ability, they'll do it inappropriately, and they'll set the house on fire. Another one is, is if you earn $50,000 or more. Now, I think that's kind of an arbitrary number. I I'm guarantee that number is going to change. But the reality is, if you have a source of disposable income, you have options people that don't have. And when you have options, you can reduce tensions, you can reduce risk, you can re reduce strain. And that becomes terribly important. Not that that money is going to change the world. Man, it sure does help. And I can tell you, as a parent, being able to get daycare or uh, child support 
you know, to sit down and say, I have a babysitter come in, or I don't have to worry about a bottle of milk, we can go get this, and money's really not an issue, it affords me opportunities to respond to things that really are an issue, that you won't have time for. When you're meeting your immediate needs and you have resources available that can overcome that, your life's a hell of a lot easier. Next one is if you actually marry when you're over 25. This goes directly to maturity level, life experience, maturity level, and your viewpoint of the world. Last one uh, for this one is that if you actually wait six months or longer after you're married to actually have children, you're going to go through monstrous changes when you have a committed relationship. Throwing children into a mix who are little tyrants, they're all about need and them, that puts strains naturally on a relationship, particularly when you're trying to figure out the last one. Now, all these, these are all demographic type issues. Very little of this you're actually being able to control. I mean, some of it. But we're talking about demographics here. And these are open statistical de demographics. We're not talking about the things that you can control day in, day out that will actually vastly exceed these. So if these numbers are looking good, the next couple of slides will improve your life immensely. One of the first things that I'll tell, sit down and tell you to do is start practicing hygiene. This is a non-medical, non-technological intervention that changed humanity. Simply washing your hands and conducting simple, basic hygiene improved human life expectancy 50% in less than 10 years. Simply washing your hands. If you can increase your life expectancy, me. If you can increase your lifespan by following these simple stuff, what can you do to relationships if you did the same? So what does that look like? What does relationship hygiene look like? Stop playing with shit. First off, it's never going to turn out the way you think. Okay? really isn't. The second one is, in all honesty, you're not prepared for it. I doubt there's any clinical psychologist in the room. There may be one or two because of the speakers. But the vast majority of people are ill-prepared for cluster B uh, personality disorders. And somehow we're always attracted to them. Right? You're not prepared for it. Not only that, cluster B personality types don't want to be fixed, particularly by you. If they're not looking for help, don't go get providing it. You want to piss them off? Tell them how you can help them. All right. So not only are you not prepared, they don't want it. The other is I'm going to ask this question. This is going to be a personal one. What the fuck's wrong with you guys? Why would you be attracted to this? Why would you be attracted to cluster B personality types? Why are you so damaged that this becomes something, yeah, daddy wants crazy. Yeah, you over there, yeah crazy. Not the healthy woman, not the woman without problems, not the women who know how to navigate this world, not the women who know how to navigate and create and foster healthy relationships and social structures. No, daddy doesn't want that. I want that half-armed, tatted girl, piercings, blue hair, you know, the one that's going to be sexually promiscuous. I want to damage, I want to deal with damaged goods. Stop playing with shit. It's a harsh thing to say. Leave damaged goods alone. When you go to the shopping, shopping mall, when you look at things on the shelf, and you sort through a number of products, you're shopping for whatever it is, and you look through the box, are you buying the damaged box? No. Why would you bite this into your life? You're choosing to do this. If you have a choice between healthy and not, go the extra mile and get the healthy package. Last one. I'm going to steal this from uh, Jordan Peterson. It's a quote. Fix your own shit first. Now, he may not have actually said it in that regard. He may have said something a little more polite, like uh, make your bed before you do anything else. Make your own bed before you go out and make in the world. Fix your shit before you expect hers to be fixed. Start from within, and you'd be surprised at how the type of people you'll start attracting. Shit that won't play with itself. Okay? And shit will stick to whatever it touches. 
If you stop doing that, if you stop playing with shit, you can vastly increase your life expectancy of your relationships. Social media is another great one. I don't think it's necessarily a positive thing. It has the ability to be a positive tool, but it's not being utilized as a positive tool. If you carry your phone throughout the house, you probably got a problem. If the first thing you do in the morning is you check your social media status instead of your partner, you've got a problem. If you spend more time, energy, and focus and resource on social media, then do you on your partners, on your social, true social network, your physical so social network, and the people around you, your loved ones, you've got a problem. And that problem is called an addiction. And like all addictions, they end poorly. Social media retards our ability to socialize. We project. We don't use this appropriately. And in this regard, social media very much is like alcohol or cigarettes. It's the most current addiction we have. And like alcohol and cigarettes, both are highly addicting, and when used to excess, lead to detrimental effects. They make your life worse, not better. The other is for the ladies. You want to improve your life, and it goes right up to playing with shit? Stop shaking the bad boy tree. You have been enabled by society and feminism to be able to go out and shake the bad boy tree, to pursue your sexual interests unfettered. The problem is you are actually bringing this into your own life. And when you shake the bad boy tree, when you go after that and you make a conscious decision to do it because you're attracted to it, they're more fun, they're more outgoing, they're exciting, that's your responsibility. All right? Do not expect good men and husbands to fall out of that tree. Likewise, guys, stop shaking the fucking whore tree. Good women are not going to naturally fall out. Mothers don't naturally, well, mothers will fall out of the tree, not good ones. They'll be single mothers. Okay? All right? Let's stop shaking that bad boy. All right? That's your responsibility. Now, here's, here becomes the problem. This is what I call virtue diabetes. What happens when you actually shake the bad boy tree and, and the whore tree and you get all these non-virtuous people and events in your life? You become resistant to virtue. You don't know what virtue looks like. And you can't interact with virtue very well. It's very much like being insulin resistant. Okay? Now, and I want you to think for a moment. Think of the women you kind of want to get with. All right? We kind of have that vision. What would your diet look like if you actually fed on that? If that the women that we actually idealized and wanted in our lives, based on this, what would that diet look like? What would be your health markers? What would, what would become of you? And I kind of have this vision, it's kind of a nasty one. I think each of you would look like fucking Jabba the Hutt. Okay, and there you would sit, going, ah, 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 ah. you know, like Jabba the Hutt fucking does. More red pill, more red pill, bring me the Rolo. Right? You're going to do that. <laughs> All right? And I'm not, not saying he's a bad guy in this case. I'm really not. And he's, he's done some seminal work. And if you haven't read his first volume, the next two are stellar as well. All right? But the bottom line is you don't want to get virtue diabetes. You want to be making better decisions. Yourself. You want to take that red pill knowledge and use it appropriately to bring you more to more compatible, appropriate relationships. My problem with the anti-red pill or the, the anti-relationship red pill stance is that it promotes an impoverished view of the world and it promotes weakness particularly of spirit. The wealthy have no problem investing. That's why they're wealthy. This is what you guys are doing, by the way, as well. You're investing in yourselves to make your world better. The middle class doesn't do that. They hoard. We call it savings. And you actually can save and, and make a meager life by protecting yourself. But in most cases, most anti-relationship red pillars are doing nothing more than playing to lose slowly. How debilitating is that? When you play to lose slowly, you're not thriving, you're not really living, and you're squandering your life. And you know, in time, you're going to end up with nothing because the casino 
always wins. In that case, the casino is Mother Nature. It promotes weakness. It promotes weakness because when you are weak, you need the sophists to tell you you can't do this, that the challenges before you are absolutely insurmountable, that all women are like that and they will destroy your marriage. All women will put torch to their homes. We live in a society that's half burnt out and collapsing and failing. When you're weak, you need those sophists. When you're weak, you're willing to fail. When you're weak, you look for opportunities to fail. There's a vast difference between being weak and being underdeveloped. If you don't know, you're just underdeveloped, particularly with knowledge. But you can change that. If you're weak, you can become strong. Now, going back to the Tyler Durden, Ed Norton case, where we talked about Ed Norton having this inner hero called Tyler Durden. I think there's something to that. I think there's something to the fact that in each of us, we want to be the hero in our own lives. And I think that's a positive thing. But I think we need to take it a step further. I think we need to look and find the true inner hero in ourselves. What that will be, not, not some Marvel comic book superhero, but the real you that does heroic things. And in each of your minds, I think each of you know in your whatever predicament you're in, you know exactly right now what that inner hero would do to change your life. And the further separated you are from your hero, your real hero on the inside, is lost potential. And if you do nothing more than to lean towards that inner hero and start doing the things you know your inner hero would do to succeed, to thrive, to win, your life is going to dramatically change. I also say this. Nature is going to win. It is remorseless. It is consistent. It's going to outlast all of us. It is also concrete. We know the elements of hypergamy and hypogamy are fairly well known. They're solid. They're established. They're concrete. We can analyze them. We can respond to them. We also know that hypergamy and hypogamy are a call to action. It's not a warning. It is a call to action. It demands action, not just understanding and awareness. You need to respond to that. Lastly, I'll say one more thing in regard to this. Hypergamy and hypogamy are inspiration. We should be inspired to these challenges. As men, we should be rising up to meet them. Women need to rise up to meet them. We need to both demand that in our opposite, and we need to command that ourselves. That's the natural order of things. Not one sex against the other, but the place in the middle where they overlap, when we're brought together. This particular one bothers me the most, is the anti-relationship stance that a lot of red pillars have, is that it takes our tremendous potential for being a parent in committed relationships. And it teaches us to hold that value in contempt. Think about that. Your p massive potential of being a partner and parental potential to be held in contempt. It's revolting. It suffers not only from a lack of spirit, it suffers from a lack of soul. And that is a human tragedy. Any institution, philosophy, society, culture that doesn't put family, marriage, and relationships first is going to be fundamentally wrong. Fundamentally wrong as to our human nature. Fundamentally wrong that is an anti-thriving. And fundamentally wrong that is self-extinguishing. You want three solid arguments why an anti-relationship stance is wrong? There are three. Counter those.
Fear is born from conditioning and experience. You're feeling that. It's real because it's there. All right? and, and I'm not casting disparages towards that. That's real. I face that myself. The difference is fear is natural, but it is a reaction. It is a natural limbic reaction. Courage, on the other hand, stands in contrast to this. Courage is a choice. Courage is what you summon when you're in fear, when you're afraid. And that is a conscious decision. And that is our human element, our cerebral cortex, overriding our limbic system for fight and flight and our mammalian system. Okay, And by the way, that brain's larger, and it has to be because it's the latest developed. But you have to train that. You have to condition yourself for that. Seneca sat down and said, we suffer more in imagination than we do in reality. I think a lot of red pill wisdom suffers from a lack of that. I think in many ways we suffer more in fear of something than we actually do. And that is not to cast disparage on the human tragedy that have occurred, the train wrecks that did occur, the wrecked marriages, the torn apart families, the damaged children, all of it. That's not how we have to live. It's not how we should be living. You need to know what you're playing for. And when you do, that can be a tremendous springboard for self-improvement. Five years ago, I very well could have been on MGTOW. My fears were that strong. I was older in nature. I was missing my biological window. And if you don't think males don't have a biological window, you've got a lot to learn. We do. It's just nature's not nearly as harsh on men in that regard than they are women. It's an unfairness of nature, but that's how it is. But at that point in time, I had a choice. And I wasn't going to be happy or willing to go in my grave not knowing, second-guessing myself. And I had the opportunity to pursue a number of different avenues and prepare myself accordingly, as I stated in my introduction. And today, I have my daughter to thank for. And I, it, it just, it's a wonder for me that I even came that close. But you need to know what you're playing for. You need to know what your mission and purpose is. That needs to be communicated with your partner. You have to be in agreement on that, because if you're going that way, you've got a world of problem. And the future belongs to those who show up prepared. A father's investment is going to grow beyond himself. It will actually survive him. The childless become less and less significant and have less investment into the future with each passing year, and depreciates yearly to the point of zero. And that is a harsh statement with nature, and nature will not care. For men who choose to lounge by the pool in today's social and cultural environment, take advantage of the free ride of hypergamy. They're advocating the future. By the way, that's our obligation and right. And compared to other men's in past, we are born kings. The day and age in which we live is an immensely glorious one. I'm not saying there aren't challenges and they're significant. But we should be worthy of today's age. I've stated decisions shape destiny, and they do. I think fundamentally each and every one of you know precisely the road you're on. You know the path you're about to take. You also know where that road ends up. My advice to you, choose that number. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Socrates. You guys have some questions. We got about seven minutes. You can come up to the mics, ask a question. Quick question: Is this the herpes glass? Did... No, there, there was a, the, the, uh, a couple couple years back. Um, they have left a glass up here, and every speaker would drink about drink off it. If that wasn't dirty enough, the first day, day and a half, it was nothing but pickup artists. So, if I didn't pour it, I'm going to ask. So. Grace be Socrates. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I've been lurking on the red pill for over a year now, 
and I lean more towards LTR. I'm in a 16 month uh, relationship right now. Okay. And I know this sounds like heresy, but I, I love this girl, but she adores me and uh, we're on the same page. She's in my frame. So I'm, I'm also a practicing Catholic okay. and I want to be a father one day and it, it would go against my conscience to uh, become a father without being married to this girl. Uh, we still haven't had sex yet. We're waiting. So why should I not get married? Like from your perspective, I, you know, I, I God, this is going to be a tough one. Only from the same, I'm, I'm in the same boat. Um, I think there are tremendous risks associated with marriage. I don't think society supports marriage. Uh, I think the civil and legal elements associated with marriage are so adverse to men, you would be crazy to do it. Uh, and, but you know, you know, for example, if we were to take it out of family law and apply it to case law. I would never go into a business and become a principal partner of any organization that had bylines that would be structured the same way it's viewed in family law. Uh, your rights as a father, as a male, I mean, for example, when we talk about marriage, what are, what are, your, what are man, man's marriage rights? Can, can we even bring that up? You know, let, me, let me step on that bomb real quick. Can we discuss what are male rights associated with marriage? Do you have marital rights? And by the way, when when you bring courts and police involved because when you can't you know, deal with things appropriately, how do the courts view your marriage rights? Do you have any? And if you, if you think you do, what are they? And when's the last time you saw them in effect? Now, I can guarantee women have more marital rights than men do because you can see it in fact because they leverage law enforcement and the courts to assure those rights. So until men are actually treated equally, appropriately, I would have severe reservations against the legal element of marriage. Now, the natural order of marriage, I absolutely fully agree. That does not diminish your willingness to commit, to be a loving partner, to commit to her, you know, in all your beliefs, to commit to your child. That sort of marriage, I absolutely, absolutely completely believe, you know, and support, and I'm doing myself. You know, so I'm not saying anything or I'm not advocating for anything I'm not doing personally. Uh, but to physically say I'm legally going to get married, I'm avoiding it myself as well, just for those reasons. Um, hey, Socrates. Uh, hey, Socrates, that was great. Um, I really appreciated your May Walt comments, because um, that is a little bit counter to the, some of the red pill wisdom that's out there. And, you know, the, the red pill community has done a lot for me personally, mm -hmm. but honestly, the AWALT thing is part of this pill that I'm having a little bit of hard time swallowing and choking that part down. Um, so I was wondering if you could maybe expand on that. Yeah, absolutely. I, uh, if you're like me, you're probably prepared to be judged a little bit as being purple pill for... for uh, no, I've been that. called worse. I've been called Captain save a -ho. Uh, I've been all, all sorts of good stuff. Uh, in, in Nawalt is, is an element that not all women are like that. And Red Pill will sit down and tell you all women are like that. But they're talking about a woman's hypergamous nature, her natural biological sexual impulses. Those don't change. And in that regard, all women are like that. All women have a natural biological sexual impulse. Likewise, all men have a natural biological sexual impulse, and that's called hypogamy. So now in that regard, we're all like that where I hear that taken astray, where it kind of goes out, is they then apply that across the board for any number of issues, that all women will destroy marriages, all women will do the following. Now, the reality is, is if you leave hypergamy unchecked, it will wreck your house and home. Very much like, for example, in having been a cheater all my life, I've only been in one in relationships in which I didn't cheat on a partner. When you leave my hypogamous interest unchecked, when you haven't been able to command my attention sexually, when you haven't been able to respond to my biological, natural sexual impulses, and you haven't been the answer to that, I'll wreck that shit too when I don't have appropriate uh, response skills. One, you're ill-prepared, and I was. And I've done some egregious goddamn things, things that I'm not proud of, things that I deeply regret and owed decent people an immense apology. Part of which is why I'm here. It's not, you know, it's, it's a kind of a, a moral shift is that where you were once moral, the way to right the world is to become moral. And not just to not do it again, but to teach others and say, hey, I know I hurt you, I damaged you, I behaved abominably. 
And while in many cases some of that may have been justified in part, it did not justify my actions. All right. And what did I do about it? I put my house, my home, my family at risk by being here, by being filmed here. My career is very much in jeopardy every time I do one of these videos, every time it's seen. Uh, and that's a risk I kind of take personally because I think I owe these people a debt of gratitude and an apology. And while I may not have said it to them, I have done something about it. And so when we talk about going back to not all women are like that, it's specifically geared towards natural biological impulses. How that plays out are individual choices, but you have to watch for that. You have to be aware that never goes away, and you have to continuously respond to that. Just because you're married, marriage is no safe shelter from hypergamy or hypogamy. Okay? And if you get that, you'll move a hell of a lot to better towards a more healthier response to a red pill role. Socrates, uh, thank you for your, um, over here, <laughs> thank you for your uh, presentation. I got bright today. lights in my face, yeah, sorry. No worries, no worries. Um, it was very timely and uh, you certainly provided value to me, so thank you for that. My question, a little bit of a two-parter, um, what counsel do you have for men who seek, to, who are thinking about seeking to create a life and a legacy that may not involve family and children, instead their impact on their community, on their society? And what would you also suggest for men who are seeking those institutions that you talked about that support them, who may not be, uh, may not find that in religious institutions right. or other community mm -hmm. organizations? There, there's a multitude of life paths you can take. Child, uh, you know, parental natures, being a parent, having children. That's kind of a common biological way in which you can transcend life. It's kind of a natural order thing, but it's not the only one. Uh, I know, you know, for example, Jack Donovan stood, not necessarily on this stage, but on a convention last year, and talked about literally there's a multitude of ways in which mankind can spread his seed throughout the universe. And that can be intellectual. So, you know, my namesake, you know, Socrates, um, I have no idea if he's ever had children. Sure as hell impacted my life. Okay? Most people here are at least aware of him. Uh, and so he impacted the world through, you know, ideology, uh, through philosophy, those sort of things that transcended, you know, um, you know, millennia. I think that's terribly powerful. Uh, as an architect, I used to believe that, you know, my God, you know, I give shape to and rise to society, and that's, that's generally true. Uh, but the problem is that I, I know that that's not the only answer. Uh, I thought it was kind of amazing when I was uh, coming off of a stage and I realized that I actually had a bigger impact, even though I do civil municipal work. I had a bigger impact on society not doing architecture, but by actually responding and teaching people who would actually fill that architecture, by making the world a better place, by making people better, uh, by bringing us together and not pulling us apart. So I think there's a multitude of ways in which we can kind of achieve similar results, you know, of you know, immortality. You know, we're, we're all due a grave. The question is, is there should be no doubt and no resistance of you sliding into that grave having lived a half-life. And so if you're looking to reconstitute an institution, you know, that, that's like a religious background or a family background, you know, for example, a very large family is an institution that will support marriage. If you don't have those, what you have here today, organizations like this, very much can fill that void and gap and actually does. I would, I would actually say this convention very much is filling a very significant role of the damage sought on by divorce that most people here have come from broker marriage or a underfathered uh, relationship structure. I know in my case that was also kind of true too, even though my parents are still married, is that in many ways my father wasn't there for a number of reasons, and I was slightly underfathered. I didn't get that particular lesson in life. And there's uh, Eric Erickson talks about developmental stages of children and adults as through life, that there's certain trajectories and arcs that you learn certain things to be a functional adult. And where there's a void, you need to go back and fill that void. Otherwise, you carry that void forward to your detriment. And so if you're able to identify that, find those cultures, seek out, and, and here's the other one, you know, it may not exist. This didn't exist until Anthony Johnson at 17 decided to create it. I can tell you right now, he talks about how I saved him. No, he saved his own damn ass. He created a circle of men in which he could fall back on and support network. I happen to be one, one of several, okay, so that supported him at the lowest point in his life. He made a video on it. You know? And so if you don't have that, you can find it 
or you can self-create it. And it doesn't take a whole lot. A mastermind group is three people. I know being in a mastermind group myself, that helped transform me into the life that I currently live. Socrates. Um, I'm a proud father of two adult daughters, 29 and 31 years old. The problem is they're both ardent feminists and strong social justice warriors. How do I navigate that relationship through a red pill lens with and keep integrity? It's very difficult. It, uh, we, we spoke a little bit last night. We're going to speak more this weekend. Uh, I'm not going to let you go. Uh, uh, that, that, that it's disturbing. You know people like you exist, uh, that you did what you could as a knowing father. You, you tried to be as the best father you could, and yet your, your children turn out in a manner in which is displeasing, counterproductive to their own, their own health, uh, their own life. Uh, the way to do it through a red pills lens is no different than if you're going to be in a relationship. These are grown adult women, and you need to have boundaries and being able to honestly express those boundaries. It doesn't mean you have to be domineering and dominant, but you have to be able to sit down and be a role figure. The other is you actually have a biological tie, and I would actually recommend actually leveraging that to, to the full extent as possible. You're their father. I have no doubt, and you expressed it, that your daughters love you. Play off that. But you're going to have to do 10, 15 years of cultural indoctrination to get them back. And it, they may never be where you really want them to be. But the fact is that they disparage men. They ridicule marriage. And they hold the idea of masculinity in contempt. And yet they love their father. I'd ask them that question. How do they score that? Yeah. And, and then listen. Because listening, in a lot of cases, pulls out, it, it cleanses the wounds of trauma that would have been inhaled, whether it was institutionalized or physical or social, however, however, whatever happened to them to create the social justice war, where they have this need, this compulsion for this. Now, I think in many cases, social justice warriors, it's a natural response. That, that it, It's a positive thing that they're trying to make the world a better place. It's terribly misguided. You know, I, I used to have friends that were socialists. I say used to, uh, they kind of have last couple of years, it's not, not, not been really good for friendships. Um, but I was, I was a lot more tolerant than I was. And I, I would take on these relationships and knowing that we had disparaging views. Uh, in many cases, though, I've been able to excise that because it was no longer beneficial, it was counterproductive. But these are your children. And you're going to be their father for life. And, and they are going to be your children for life. And so that's not going to be a relationship you can kind of cast aside. I would, I would turn into it and have an honest adult conversation with them and tell them, this hurts me. This hurts my relationship with you and I love you. I want to have a closer relationship with my daughter. And I feel that this is pushing us apart. And let, let them answer you as an adult. All right, gentlemen, we have time for one more question. Uh, have you noticed the difference between women who are raised in, say, only children and women who are raised in large families, especially women who have lots of brothers, because I've certainly noticed a difference there. Uh, also, just one comment. I noticed that hypergamy is on dictionary.com, but hypogamy is not. Uh, that's true. Yeah. Uh, depends on where you look. Uh, there's a tremendous amount of research on hypogamy uh, in Eastern Asia, primarily India, uh, and they take the view that hypogamy is a male interest to marry up. And that's kind of the parallel definition of hypergamy in shorthand marrying up. And it deals with the caste system, uh, being where many of a lower caste are marrying up into a higher caste, and that's terribly frowned upon in some cultures. And so you'll see hypogamy written about extensively in there. Uh, if you want to see hypogamy written about in a sexual psychological issue, you'll have to look at anthropological research papers and primarily white papers. You won't see it published out in the academic area in books and magazines because they won't publish it because they're being published by very liberal institutions and scholars live and die by what they publish and you better publish what's accepted. Uh, so if you want to see the information being conveyed, they have to publish and one of the ways to convey without publishing a book is a white paper. And that's typically a short dissertation on a subject matter that's probably five or six pages long. They could be longer. It's almost like a study. And they'll go into a whole series of natures of a particular element that they're researching. 
in that, you can find a tremendous amount of cited sources of hypogamy and other interests, so you'll find it there. But I'll also sit down and say red pill folks, particularly in the Reddit forums, have no interest in discussing or talking about it. And they'll use it, well, it doesn't show up in Wikipedia. I don't give a shit. Okay, to sit down and believe that women have a biological nature but men don't, that's kind of weak sauce. You know, we can have that argument. There, and we've had speakers who believe that. We've also had speakers up here who completely believe that hypergamy and hypogamy don't exist whatsoever. So keep in mind, a lot of the speakers will have very, very parallel, very similar discussions, very similar beliefs, but sometimes we're divergent. I think that's okay. I think there's room for discussion there. Ultimately, you're going to have to make up your own mind. And part of that is, I don't want to you know, read off to you chapter and verse. I, that just is bored me and trees. My personality matrix is not like that. I'm driven. I just I want the solutions that either it makes sense to me or it doesn't, and I'll, I'll continue on. I don't care if you're a PhD or not. If somebody says something, you know, for example, I could read a fortune cookie and it makes sense to me, and I go, you know, there, there's some sense here. I don't need to go looking on the back for the citation. Now, going back to your first question, uh, have I seen a difference between somebody from a large family and small, different, yeah, absolutely. I think very much personalities are developed by the relationship structures that we imprint on uh, because we're mammals, and an only child will have a vastly different imprinting process and experience than somebody from a family of 10. Uh, my partner is number nine of 10, and I can guarantee you her social personality makeup is very much different than any of the women who I dated previously who were only children. Uh, in that regard, uh, an only child tends to be very self-absorbed, uh, world-centric, tends to be a lot more narcissistic. Uh, somebody from a large family, depending on the range where they were at within that, uh, the bottom range, is that they did not necessarily have a lot of room and they don't take up a lot of emotional space. She tends to be an introvert and doesn't communicate. She'll communicate things through behavioral values. I need to be aware of her communication patterns. So where a only child may be very vocal about her emotional needs, my partner, coming from a family of 10 and the, the, the youngest daughter, tends to be very nonverbal, non verbal So I have to watch the behavioral language. And so there's kind of a running joke is when she tells me fine, I have to ask, are you fine or are you fine? And then watch the behavioral patterns. And when she says fine, I don't sit there and do this, okay, you're fine. I actually sit down and go, fine, and I take out a thermometer, and I check her thermometer. What's her temperature? What, what's her personality? What's going on? Where, what's the context? Okay, because I'm looking for all the micro-expressions that are going to tell me the truth, okay? Because behavioral patterns, people can conceal verbally what they believe, but their micro-expressions, okay, and we had a speaker here talk about body language, People are not used to considering <clears throat> body language. So I'll actually monitor that, but you can bet your ass there's going to be a difference. And you should know about it, and you should plan accordingly. So, and, and I actually do, and I'm part of my management and maintenance protocols that I do within my, my relationship. That's kind of a pattern which I, I'll, I'll, I'll take, and that's part of what I'm obligated to do is to lead that relationship. And part of that is to read her to understand communication, to make sure that communication dialogue is taking place. Because if I just sit down and say she's fine, I'm abdicating. And over time, if she doesn't have the ability to communicate appropriately, overtly, she'll, she'll set the house on fire. Right? It's not that she's a bad person, but she'll get frustrated, tensions will build up, anxiety will build up, resentment will build up, alienation builds up, isolation will occur. All the things that are deteriorative for healthy relationships. So your job is to actually as being involved in a relationship. Be aware of it, develop those skills, and then manage that. That's all the time we have. Gentlemen, give it up for Socrates. Thank you.